In this episode of the Azure Essential Show, we're continuing our conversation with two Microsoft corporate vice presidents about how co-pilots can be used to put esoteric tools to work. So stay tuned. Joining me again today are Vijay Mittal, uh, Corporate Vice President and Chief AI Transformation Advisor at Microsoft Research, and Uli Hohmann, Corporate Vice President and Distinguished Architect in the Cloud and AI business at Microsoft. In this episode, which is part of our series on Essential AI for Businesses, uh, we're talking about how you can use co-pilots for putting uh, esoteric tools to work. So Uli, Vijay, welcome back. Thank you for having us, Jacob. Thank you, dear Jacob. Good to see you guys. So every major enterprise that I've worked with have had teams that produce uh, analytics and, computer and computational models. You know, examples are uh, simulations of shipping container uh, movements or uh, models of metal fatigue uh, and models of how uh, drugs move inside the body. I mean, how do you see these uh, models and algorithms uh, moving forward in the uh, Gen AI era? Vijay, uh, this first question to you. Thanks indeed, Jacob. Uh, look, I just want to firstly clarify, we're talking here of models, solvers, and simulators that are really big compute algorithms rather than AI models. I mean, as you say, these are enormous enterprise assets. People have invested huge amounts of, of, of intellectual capital uh, in them. But the problem today is that very few people in a company know how to configure a simulation of our containers move and what to change in case of a cat you know, catastrophic event. What are the logistics? What are the constraints? Or how, does, how do drugs move or CO2 disperses in a rock formation? The part that I'm most excited about for generative AI here is generative AI can help almost anyone use these tools. We can teach generative AI to learn the parameters, learn the limitations and strengths of these tools and map them to the user's context. So in the previous transformation wave that Uli referred to uh, in, in an earlier session, you know, the call used to be liberate the data. Now it's liberate the models. So Uli, I want to hand over to you really here. The question for you is, you know, these are very compute intensive models and people have been using them on-prem in workstations and very large uh, compute instances or even on PCs. Now, how do you think about these now that we open up access to so many more people? That's, a, that's a great question, Vijay. Um, <clears throat> so think of the uh, issue as a two-step problem. The first step is how do you package them up so that they become accessible uh, in modern compute infrastructures. And the world has moved to Kubernetes as its next generation infrastructure. And that means containerization or containers. Um, so OCI containers to be more precise. And so part of what's happening in the industry is that a lot of these solvers, a lot of these simulation capabilities are now being packaged up um, as part of or into containers and then deployed into Kubernetes uh, distributions running on hyperscale clouds like Azure, Azure Container Services or Kubernetes Services um, are effectively what's going on. That means now you have a modern infrastructure that can run anywhere. You have a way to distribute the workloads. You have a way to control the workloads, apply policy and those kind of capabilities. The next step, and that's also something that uh, is being driven very hard by actually the Gen AI community as well, is moving those Kubernetes instances to high-performance computing. So marrying the modern infrastructure abstraction that uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation has been driving, so Kubernetes, containers, those kind of things, with the ability to use high-performance compute, which is really a combination of GPUs plus networking uh, optimization, so InfiniBand and other high-speed networks, so that these compute-intensive models can A, be distributed very easily, but then can work with each other over networks, compute nodes, and so forth in order to drive the results. So this is really uh, where the world is moving. And then uh, this is something that I think we will see more and more of where standardization on Kubernetes and then utilization of advanced compute capabilities like high-performance computing uh, is going to be the norm going forward. 
And Uli, can I just ask you, I mean, how do you think of the line between HPC, high-performance computing, and advances in quantum computing, for example? It's going to be an interesting conversation down the line uh, where we see high-performance computing doing really well today, even with quantum methods. Uh, in one of the previous sessions, I talked about an element that we found uh, together with a, a battery company. And that was actually done on high performance computing, but using quantum approaches to the problem. So matrix math, those kind of things. Um, whereas in the quantum computing realm, I think the key difference is going to be if we can figure out entanglement uh, and some other quantum effects and how to use this uh, to manipulate the matrix of uh, connected elements um, at simultaneously. And once we figure out how to do that, I think you will see very large advances that HPC can't do, simply right. because there is no entanglement in normal computing. So you need that kind of capability. And since we're talking about matrix manipulation, as soon as the matrix has stayed in multiple places at once, I can only imagine what the uh, possibilities are for math, uh, biology, chemistry, science, uh, those kind of scenarios. Great. Uh, Uli, one, one question here from my side. Uh, I, I want to just take a, a very quick step back when you talk about how everything is getting containerized. Um, you, you know, I, I, I guess, and, and you know, I'm interested in your perspective on this, but I guess that would also allow, uh, just bring this back to, the, to, to also to the business lens of it, allow companies to uh, share uh, IP to work in ecosystems in, in more secure ways and and if you think about it even allow them uh, to think about this in the context of revenue streams yeah i mean jacob i think you're up to a really interesting point here um in the previous realm when you were thinking about simulation and other complex technologies they were always deployed in custom ways everybody every company did it their own way with this standardization on uh, Kubernetes and containers, you now have the ability to utilize standard infrastructure, which means it's cheaper and it's faster, uh, faster to market, faster to value. And then you can also start to say, well, since we are now working on standard infrastructure, advances in data sharing um, and uh, ideas to build networks of compute uh, s systems across companies or within a company uh, are becoming much, much easier. So that's the power of standardization on infrastructure and where the specialized solutions now follow and utilize that infrastructure rather than trying to build everything themselves. Uh, th th this is this is very interesting. Uh, it brings me to my next question. I mean, so so in this context, how do you think that Gen AI, uh, or do you think, let me put it like that, the Gen AI would replace such computational model solvers and simulators as, as Vijay just clarified as we were going in, is the guidance that customers should find ways of, of let's sort of, sort of say, building these models using uh, large uh, language models, uh, Uli? Well, as always, um, in the compute world, or maybe in all solution worlds, we have hype cycles. Uh, the Gartner folks are doing a great job uh, explaining how this works. And Gen AI is obviously now the answer to all questions. Well, we all know that that's not true. Uh, we all know that technologies that were there before will still be there, although augmented potentially, like Vijay pointed out, with Gen AI scenarios. And I think that's going to be a key part. And Gen AI will also help solvers and other things not only to be more accessible, but also to be more powerful. Uh, in terms of how the system works, uh, what uh, the system actually can do. The other half of that, I would say, is think about um, large language models as only the one type of model. Uh, because we are now seeing, uh, for example, Microsoft and others are investing in large chemistry models, large biology models, large physics models that use the similar techniques uh, with respect to deep learning, uh, using a lot of data and so forth but in a different domain. So we are not using language as the domain, we're now using chemistry as the domain or biology. And I think that's going to be a really big boost for those kind of scenarios where simulation and uh, solvers have been dominant. Um, I think they will be augmented by these large specialized domain models uh, to go and help that. And then you throw in 
uh, cloud-based computing with respect to hyperscale of high-performance computing. We talked already a little bit about that. And then you throw in quantum and you can start yeah. to see the world of science changing quite dramatically with these kind of capabilities. However, it's never going to be X or, I think it's going to be and, um, and we will see how far the and can go at the end of the day. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on what Uli said. There's, this is, you know, there's no one panacea. We're going to see advances on multiple areas. Uh, you know, there's one thing though that's really in, intrigues me, how there is a blurring of lines between deep learning on one side, you know, transformation models, whether large language models, as or as Uli referred to, large biology models, large physics models, and so on, and computational methods, which are simulations, equation solving. So what, what we're seeing here is some researchers are using equation, using equation solving simulators to generate data. Then they feed into large learning models and learn from that. So for example, hard to sample information, like how does a chemical plant behave under very unusual situations? You can't get data for that from, from you know, you don't have historical data. So you use a simulation to create that data, feed it into a machine learning model. So hopefully you don't have to run that simulation, that expensive compute again. So these are exciting times. I mean, really, we are seeing advances in ways that we really could not have imagined. You know, there's, a, there's a really cool example, Vijay. So I've been working with one of the Formula One teams uh, in racing. And Formula One is obviously using a ton of simulators, wind simulation and other things. But they are very, very hard rules in terms of how much time they can use, where they can do it, how it looks like in terms of the high performance computing infrastructure and so forth. So there are limits. And so a lot of the Formula One teams are looking for how can I get more time in the wind tunnel without breaking the rules? And so these guys are looking at AI as a way to augment their wind tunnel work. It doesn't go away, but now that they have wind tunnel data, they can go and feed advanced uh, physics models using AI uh, to go and get more time on the data to help uh, with the wind tunnel work. So it's a pretty cool example of how what we just talked about is being utilized in a very advanced racing environment. Yeah, and my, my complaint here, Uli, is that you involve me in things like chemical plants, which are very worthy. I wish you'd involve me in the Formula One part as well. Well, we are not done yet, so I'm sure we can get that moving. So, 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 sign me up as well. And, 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 and with that, that concludes uh, today's session. So uh, thank you so much. VJ, really for you for your time today, uh, and for our viewers, uh, if you have questions or, or comments about today's topic, uh, be sure to add them below, and, and we will get back to you. Uh, so thank you so much for watching the Azure Essential Show, VJ and Uli. Again, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Great Jacob. fun.